I guess 35 years is longer than two decades. Yeah. <laughs> so, Lloyd, I, know, I don't know about you, but when Warren was uh, introing, and he talked about Churchill from failure to failure, I know I looked at you and just, is he talking about me or is he talking? <laughs> well, it just goes to show our respective personalities because you were worried he was talking about you, and I assumed he was talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks for coming to Boston. <clears throat> no, Glad to be good. here. You did spend seven years here, so you're no stranger. I still get PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> so Warren uh, described a little bit of uh, Lloyd's background, but there's, there's probably a, another shade of that, which is Lloyd grew up in Brooklyn. Yep. Uh, East New York, maybe, the, the part of Brooklyn that hasn't. Somebody say, if anybody asked me where I'm from, it would never dawn on me to say New York City. <laughs> Yeah, I'm from Brooklyn. Father was a postal worker. Your mother was a receptionist. Um, went to the local high schools. Lived in public housing. So you, you, you start to look at that as, a, as the beginning of your life. And then somehow you became valedictorian of your high school class. So I don't know how you pulled that one off. Well, I spoke English. <laughs> <laughs> and then on to Harvard. It gave me a leg up. <laughs> But the question that's, that I'm sure is on everybody's mind, so on my mind, so what was the secret sauce? You know, how did you go from that humble background to where you are today? I mean, what, is, what inspired you? You know, well, those are all different questions. You know, one of the reasons, I always think, how did you get to a place yeah. when you're in the place? And it's kind of a, a, a funny, you know, being in, a, in the risk business and thinking of things in a kind of mathy way a lot. Someone was... Someone, the, the odds were very remote that I'd be in this place from where I started, <laughs> but someone would have been here. And so there was 100% certainty you'd be asking that question of someone. But so I'll ask you the second one, which is what inspired me, because there's a lot of there's a lot of luck. I was smart enough yep. um, and ambitious enough and a lot of things enough, but some people were more. And some people, there's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of luck. Uh, a chance in the world now. I don't take anything away because you have to respond to luck and you have to seek it out sometimes and sometimes you answer a knock on the door and sometimes you're standing sure. by the door and answer it when it's knocking on somebody else's door. So I'm saying I'm not going to diminish it, but I didn't forecast this. I went to, uh, you know, it was, it was great and a flash that I got into college. It was unbelievable. I, didn't, I got into Harvard. I didn't get into others. But somehow they did it, which is why I'm to this day I'm loyal and very supportive because they found, you know, they came and I wasn't that obvious. I went to law school because I had no idea what to do when I practiced law. And then from then, I didn't plan anything. I didn't, I, a lot of people leave law firms after a few years. I was one of them. I couldn't get a job. Uh, I, people were applying to Wall Street firms, which I did, and I got turned down, in this case, by all of them, <laughs> you know, as I would have turned me down. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, and I, you know, including Goldman, you know, and Dean Witter and firms that don't exist. But I got a job at a small commodity trading firm called J. Aaron and Company, um, and and I found out after the fact that they hired everybody. They had this, uh, they had this, uh, they had this metaphor. This was a very streety firm, and they had this metaphor that they used to use about their hiring practices. They caught, they, they thought of it as mud down a sluice. And if they just poured as, as much mud as they could down the sluice, you had a better chance of finding a diamond at the end of it. So they'd hire like 30 people intending to have two at the end of a year. And, I was, and so that's what I went, that's what I did. And then um, just as I was like saying, what am I doing here? They got acquired by Goldman. So I joined, you know, right about that time. And that's how I got into Goldman, having got, uh, and so that was lucky. And then nobody... When I got to Goldman in the precious metals, it, was the, it turns out it was the only international business that Goldman had. <laughs> it was a very domestic firm. They could, you couldn't get a confirm in any currency but dollars. This was at the wave of internationalization. Um, and they asked me to do stuff in foreign exchange and to help hedge out some British gas investments. It was, a, it was the first, <laughs> earliest thing. So, so I found myself... You know, given my, you know, I was such a natural given my given my roots in East New York, Brooklyn, to become the great internationalist. <laughs> but I found myself by quirky circumstances there, and then 
that was a that was a huge theme. And so I just wrote, you know, I, I got I, I, I can't got caught up in that vortex of that, and I and I and I grew up in and I grew in the organization. Now, I'm not. You know, I don't want you to think I'm, you know, falsely or otherwise modest. I did well in that context, yeah. but so did a lot of people would have. But yeah. it's like um, the smartest, best, needy people who are making the biggest contribution to the firm weren't put in those new areas. Hmm. They were too valuable. It's like, uh, you hmm. know, who populated the new world? Right. The third sons who didn't get, <laughs> who didn't get, who, who weren't lucky enough to get those two and a half acres, <laughs> in, uh, uh, you know, f- from their fathers. So you and I have known each other for, I don't know, a couple of decades. And my favorite time with you is always when we talk about the financial crisis. And 10 years ago, um, you know, I was on the edge of it. I became CEO just after the financial crisis. You became CEO in 2006. Uh, uniquely uh, replacing Hank Polson, who right. became Treasury Secretary. A few years pass, and the, you know what hits the fan. Yeah, like less than a year. And, and you're right there, right. you know, with Goldman, Hank's on the other side. Share some insight stories, you know, right. some, of the, yeah, some of those moments when you weren't sure it was going to get fixed. Well, I knew it was, yeah, of course. Um, you know, we could talk, we spent a lot of time, you know, going through this stuff, but it was a, you know, it was very unnerving. I was very philosophical. I've been thinking, you know, because, you know, being a naturally uh, fatalistic person, I said, <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> if I'm going to be a CEO, the world's going to blow up. <laughs> of this, uh, and it's not like, you know, Goldman Sachs, you know, big balance sheet company, we're involved in everything. And so nothing can go wrong anywhere without affecting us. But oddly... You know, just this goes to show how much we punch above our weight. We were viewed as ground zero for the mortgage crisis. We don't do mortgages. <laughs> um, that's pretty good. We buy mortgages from other people, and so then, therefore, we could be an enabler um, because we bought mortgages from other people who had bad origination practices. We may have unsold them in a bad way, mm-hmm. possibly, you know, alleged, or... We enabled other people who had bad practices to sell what they had, get money, do other things, none of which mm-hmm. I think was necessarily the case, but that was it. But we're hardly ground zero for the mortgage crisis because we really not, we're only derivatively or secondarily into it. But we're very high profile, and if you pick up, you know, you, if you're in New York, I'm in the paper every day <laughs> in, the, in the Post, and, and frankly, a lot of the, paper, of, uh, part of the national papers, we get a lot of attention. Uh, so we were getting it. The financial crisis for us came in two parts. There was the existential part where nobody knew who had what, who was solvent, who, who had liquidity. And that we na- navigated very, very you know, well um, by not, not you know, by, you know, largely because we ran our business in a sensible, I'll say this, a sensible way. We hedged. If we bought something, we sold it. Some people thought, gee, housing can't go down anymore. Some people thought housing prices were going to go to zero. We had people at the center of the firm who managed that and would let people go along if other people, you know, you, that whole stuff. But that was done sensibly, and so that was the existential part. And there was about five minutes where people said, how did you do it? <laughs> and where I felt good for about five minutes because it was, you know, people were looking for us to, you know, get blow up or something, and we didn't. Um, and then... 15 minutes later, it was, how did you do it? <laughs> which was kind of the reputational part of it, which because all that hedging that we did, we bought, we sold. Well, why would you sell that when you know it's going down? I said, well, we didn't know it going down. Well, you sold it. Why'd you sell it? Well, you sell it because we bought it over here. <laughs> I said, well, don't tell me about that, that side. Tell me. And so you saw all that and got involved. And there was nothing about my early training um, that would you know, prepare Performing, you for that. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you learn how to cope. Now, the existential part, and I have to say we got through it, but it wasn't like at every moment I was, you know, I thought, and, and you know, very clinical about this. I've been in the risk business. I came up through the trading side, managing the risks of the firm forever uh, for a long period of time. But, you know, I didn't get that way because I'm like happy guy <laughs> and go, happy go lucky. I looked at this stuff and I'm saying, gee, there's a percentage. What are the percentage probabilities of the world blowing up? And let me tell you, I'll insure, we'll all insure our houses that have a 0.001% risk. I didn't like going to bed if there was a 15% risk of things melting down. Mm-hmm. And so 
I would say when people go out and now evaluate how regulators and decisions that were made and everybody is on a high horse, oh, you shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have intervened in the market. See, it didn't blow up. Yeah, it didn't blow up because that's what they did. Hmm. And it might not have blown up, but who, who, who of any kind of responsibility would allow the country to go along with put a number on a 15, 20% chance of that kind of a meltdown. Mm. It would have been irresponsible. And so I think they did a, um, a good job. But we did have to negotiate, uh, we did have to get along from weekend after weekend where you know, there was one crisis after another. And fortunately, we just didn't know what it would, how long it would be. If somebody would have told me that it would have been as bad as it was for as long as it was, I would have, uh, you know, I wouldn't have gotten out of bed. <laughs> and, but since every time it seemed like, in hindsight, it was reasonable that it would take as long as it did and there was as much rough stuff to handle as it did. But at the time, of course, you don't know and so you just get up and you do what you do. You can... And you had Hank Polson, Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, you know, all in the center trying to... I think to they did a very, you know, again, in the fog of war, people will write dissertations for the next hundred years about what they did and find fault with everything. They should have done this, they shouldn't have done that, they should have optimized. But in the, let me tell you, in the fog of war, when you didn't know what was gonna happen, when you had to make decisions of huge consequence to the outcome and also take a lot of risk with respect to their own reputations, mm. it wasn't even a matter of, you know, for most people it would be, what's the right thing to do? But in that context of the politics that existed at that moment, if you knew the right thing to do, how hard is it to do something where you know if it all goes well, people are going to hate you, right? I mean, because if it all went well, they think you didn't need to do that stuff. And if it went badly, they'd also hate you. And so they were putting themselves, and so we're sitting there, all these you know, guys who make, you know, make a lot of money and do this and have that, and you know whether or not there was this level of responsibility or that level, we were still in or around the scene of the crime, if you want to call it that. We were involved in that and in, in managing the, in the finances, you know, not as a whole, but in our own contribution. And the regulators who had to sort this out, I'd say they did a very good job and um, should be honored for it. And if people want to poke at them, because now people are saying, oh, you should have, could have. I mean, that's, that's kind of petty. Yeah. And so 10 years forward, uh, the country has healed uh, from a financial standpoint. Ish. 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 That's where I'm going to. And, you know, the, if you look at the economy, it's, uh, you know, pushing on 3%, unemployment's at 4%, signs of inflation, Fed's tightening. Uh, and, and if you even widen your lens, if you look around the world, you know, the emerging markets seem to be performing quite well, the developed markets equally, you know, with some exceptions. So it feels like a moment, I guess they say, a synchronized recovery, um, like everything's going in the right direction, and those are the moments I worry about. So what, what is your... You know, when you evaluate these things, it's, you know, I'm reminded of, you know, the Cho and Wei comment asked about the French Revolution. He said it's too soon to tell. <laughs> I mean... When World War I was over, they said, oh, gee, what, were the what, was, what happened? And then a hundred, you know, 200 years from now, where even now, World War II is a continuation of all the unresolved elements of <laughs> World War I. Yeah. So you don't know. I'm not sure that we're not, you know, maybe the financial crisis is distinctly over, mm -hmm. and now it's a new world. It's kind of a restart, and now whatever happens from this moment is sui generis and starting over, or... Another way of looking at it is, depending on what happens, we may see this all as a piece with that financial crisis, which itself was a function of bubbles yep. and you know, ties in with the whole inequality and how things are going. Because I could say, looking at, if I had to predict, you know, where th looking at the, you know, things are going great, and I am an optimist about this, and I do think there's a long runway ahead and things look pretty good, but when you look at around corners and you see what is kind of a little bit off, you could say, well, a lot of the bank issues in the United States around the world right. have been solved but the by migrating the problem to the sovereign balance sheets, to the governments. So all, you know, so the banks look pretty good, 
but the Fed has $4 trillion <laughs> of debt on its balance right. sheet. And it's even more, we're not in a European audience now, but in Europe they really know what that meant because all the European banking system is fixed, but the Europeans are also buying up all the debt, you know, are also putting all the debt. The budget deficits haven't contracted, they've widened. The banks buy the debt, then walk over to the European Central Bank, finance it, get new money so they could buy the next round of debt. And so you have countries with way bigger deficits as a percentage of GDP than the U.S. that are financing, that, that are borrowing money for 10 years at 3% or 2.5%. Really? And so you could say, and the banks look okay, but it's the sovereigns that look risky, mm -hmm. like Greece. And you wonder, is the next crisis going to be a sovereign crisis? And if it is, it'll just be a continuation of... Re the people look back and said... You know something, what we really did, what happened is we didn't fix the, the, the outcome of the financial crisis. We left that open, and as a result of leaving that open, it's been, a long, it's been really a 30-year workout. Got it. Got so it. that's how... You know, one of the things that um, embedded within the question of the recovery that's a mystery to many people, many economists, is that um, our productivity hasn't improved. And, and I'm going to connect that with technology and say... Because hey, everybody's looking at Facebook all day. Right? <laughs> that could be. Um, but the, the question around technology is disrupting every business that we know of. Every business. Every. And so, you know, within Goldman, um, talk to me about, talk to us about technology. H how are you thinking about, and I'm not talking about traditional technologies, but machine learning and blockchain yeah. and artificial And I could do this, look, we're, in, you know, we're advisors in a lot of different industries, so I, I deal with this disruption in other, in, obviously in other industries because, I mean, look at the way things are, look at M&A now, you know, our, I mean, look at, the, look at the media telecom space, everybody's getting Every into segment, yeah. People aren't just aggregating people. You have cable companies that want to get, that buy, that buy telephone and mobile and that buy satellite because they don't know what's going to win. It used to be, you know, gee, if, someone, if, a, if a mobile company was going to merge, it would merge with another mobile company, but a mobile company may be more valuable to a cable company <laughs> because they, you just have to make bets or it's every industry. An automobile, like you still need 17 million cars if they're all riding around. Uh, you still need property, you still need casualty insurance companies if those cars don't bump into anything. Mm -hmm. Although the occasional person, yeah. but not, <laughs> but not, you know, you don't know. It's new, but it probably there'll be less, fewer accidents. You know, you can go industry by industry. For us, it obviously manifests in a lot of positive ways, some negative ways. But for us, I'll give you one indication. Goldman Sachs has been the ultimate wholesale firm. I just said we don't go get a mortgage at Goldman Sachs or mm -hmm. a credit card or something sure. like that. Marcus. So the first, after 148 years, we're going into a consumer lending business. How, how could that, why would we do that? How could that be? It's not, it's, and, and the people, the press say, oh my goodness, you, you're going into this, you're looking for things to... It's not so much that we changed, is that the opportunity changed because of technology. Because originally, if you think of lending, consumer lending, you know, daily savings and loan, look into people's soul, you make 500 loans, you have to know the character, and you, know, you have stores and people come in and they pour their store and you tell them their story. But if you make 500 loans, that's what it is. But if you make 50 million loans, it's math. Right. It's algorithms, it's digital distribution, it's risk management, all core strengths of ours. I mean, every time you put down a credit card, somebody's making a loan to you. They're not asking you a lot of questions there, something in a, in a, in a heartbeat, less than a heartbeat. They're making a credit decision. So that's a core strength of ours. It wouldn't have been before. And there's obviously a consumer experience element at the other end of the, uh, the computer. Mm -hmm. And you, we, we have to import that and develop and grow some new mu uh, muscles. Service centers, we have a service center we wouldn't have had before. Um, but it now behooves us to be uh, deposit takers, um, you know, which we did by buying a platform from, uh, from GE, um, and, and growing our own consumer business 
Marcus, these are muscles that we, didn't, you know, we never exercised before, didn't have. And so that's a change in our business. And, and for us, it took, you know, there was an evolution here because you know, we became a bank holding company over a weekend and we were finding assets we could put into it because we are a wholesale business. We don't do a lot of bank-like activities that could even be in a bank. Mm. And so we were looking around at, you know, Tim, what could we put in a bank to give it some heft so it would be a bank? Then the second go around, then 2.0, was, gee, there's a cheaper source of funding that comes with a bank. Why don't we take advantage of it and take other activities and put those in a bank that don't have to be in a bank, but we could put that, we can put them in a bank. 3.0 was, gee, we're a bank. Should we be doing stuff we wouldn't have ever considered doing, but now can do because we're a bank? And the answer is yes. And in this consumer business, for us, just to give you our mindset, is a lot of what we'll be doing is refinancing credit card balances, which is a gigantic market. And people, there are a lot of people in the world who finance themselves. You know, if anybody has, you know, statistically, I don't have it at my fingertips, but a huge percentage of the country couldn't pay a $200, you know, bill for it to a dentist without taking out a loan. I mean, that's, you know, we don't live, most of us don't live in that world, but that is the world. And people run up constant credit card balances, and as you know, or may not know, because I'm sure you all pay your credit cards off the second you get the bill, people are paying rates of 21, 22, 24%. Those institutions, which are normal banks, have no incentive to offer people consumer loans at 10, 11, or 12 percent. We are either cursed or blessed with no consumer business, no legacy operations. If we had one, it would be the best part of, that, of our business, mm -hmm. the highest returns, but we don't have that. The normal folks who would disrupt that business, the Silicon Valley crowd, sure. aren't bank holding companies and can't take deposits to fund them. And so you get, and some of you know the names, have been out there doing it. Those don't work that well mm -hmm. because they have to package them and on-sell the loans. They can't be flexible because it doesn't sit on their balance sheet. It has to be packaged and sold to people who take all the margin from it. So we're kind of a weird place. We're a bank with no legacy bank businesses, normal yeah. bank businesses. And that's a very odd place to be. And so we could be our own disruptor. Now, historically, we've always been very tech-oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, we promote our CFO, who is former head of technology. We have a lot of technologists in our company, a lot of the platforms that people take for granted. Arca, ICE, all these yeah. platforms. We, you know, came out of Goldman Sachs and spun off. But, so, that's us. But, you know, but, you know, it's industry by industry. Most of the changes that come from Silicon Valley uh, involve payments. Right and kind of the infrastructure and guts, because to actually do the actual banking stuff, the core banking business, there's a moat around it. And the moat is, is becoming a bank holding company, and no one in their right mind would accept the such slight benefits as being able to raise <laughs> deposits for the massive burden of the regulation <laughs> that attaches, except that we weren't given much of a choice. Right. <laughs> and so there we are. So another angle on technology, you've got a bunch of uh, Boston-based CEOs in the room, and, and I'm sure most, if not all of us, have had our marketing departments darken our door and suggest that we go on Twitter. And uh, very few have. You were one of the early adopters. You're a, you're, you tweet pretty regularly. Not that often. Well, yeah. so, so what was the thinking behind that, and what's the value of it? Well... A couple of things. One, I would say, you know, you can get something from everybody. I know I'm in the belly of the beast here in Massachusetts. I'm, I mean, it's only with some great trepidation I'd say anything positive about the president in this, in, you know, in this crowd or any crowd. <laughs> but I would say that one of the things I admire is the way he disintermediated the press. Right. I mean, really? I mean, you have to say it, you know. Henry Ford didn't invent the car, but he figured it out, and he'll, always, and he'll always be associated with that, and I think you can make a parallel to that. He certainly has used that, and, you know, if you're us and you're in the press all the time, you know, every day around 6 o'clock, somebody, you know, one of my guys is sending me, blah, 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 the Wall Street Journal has just called, this is what they're going to write tomorrow. <laughs> and then you go through, uh, and you call them up, 
and you say, oh, that's wrong, or please don't, you know, this, or let me give you, and they go, no. <laughs> this is what we're going to write. <laughs> and, you know, and so my whole, and so I felt, you know, felt like one of those villagers in the Magnificent Seven before the, you know, please leave some grain. Um, and, and then all of a sudden, I see, wow, is that? And so I'm thinking to myself, well, I, I'm not going to do that. And that's not how it's thought. But that wasn't the background thought is that I valued it. Now, we are always, we're never like that. We don't even have a name in our building. Right. Nobody, you enjoy, everybody like those Goldman Sachs commercials you see everywhere? Never. <laughs> My successes will do that at some point, but I'm too grounded in, you know, you don't put your name out. Your clients not only come first, but if they see your name, you've done something wrong. And I'm just, I'm just grounded in that. Thought so it wasn't. I was, I was at Silicon Valley uh, in, a, in a venture capital conference for their portfolio companies. I'm sitting next to a guy, and I'll say, you know, say it was a fellow who um, runs a company called, it's a private company still, called Hootsuite, which is an amalgam of other social sites. He goes, you know, all you guys are going to do this stuff. You're all going to go out and talk to the public directly. And I said, why don't you just throw it in the towel and just do it? And I said, you know, that's absolutely right. And I was sort of tweeting my press release anyway because there were things coming out like, um, you know, immigration stuff and the LGBT issue was a big issue in New York. I was the chairman of, like, uh, the New York City Partnership, which may be a, a group like this group. Mm. And I was chairman of that and during a time when those issues, marriage equality, before it became an amendment, was before the New York State Legislature, and I was in the front of that. And so I'm sending out press releases about why we need to do this. And the themes were always related to either something that Goldman Sachs had an expertise, so people would expect me to comment on it just because of our, you know, understood expertise, or in my role as um, champion of our people. If something is affecting the people in Goldman Sachs and their ability to do their job, mm. I feel like I should comment on it. So being able to move their spouses from one country to another if they're, or their you know, boyfriends or girlfriends, you know, if you were gay, you could move or you couldn't get health care or you couldn't, um, or your, you know, your spouse wouldn't get benefits in this location, they would in that location, you know, things that affected their, their business life. So I didn't reach out on just my personal issues, but mm -hmm. stuff that, mm -hmm. and I would issue press release that get reported, and, you know, I felt like that was, you know, not only, I not only was licensed to do that, I feel like kind of obligated to do that. So I was in that mix. And then, the, you know, you combine all those elements. I said, you know, I'm just going to do this. And, you know, scared to death, my fingers are trembling. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm not used to doing something where I can't get it back. And um, I did it. Um, I expect the first time I did it, I, you know, I, then I, the second time I used an emoji. And, you know, <laughs> there was an American flag and I, I commented something. And I went to the flags and I found the American flag. I put it in. And then it was going and clicking through. And then uh, somebody said, why'd you put the Liberian flag? <laughs> and I go, what are you talking about? And then I went back, Did you, who knew that the Liberian flag looks exactly like the U.S. flag, except, and then I said, how do I get it down? And so the guy goes, no, you can't take it down. It's really bad if you, once it goes up, you look really bad because people will know. I said, thank you very much. Get it down. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be. So I'd rather have, yeah, so... I, I felt my way along, and then being a kind of, snark, you know, kind of a, my natural snark yeah. worked, so, you know, just got back, you know. Which they're picking up on. You know, how did, <laughs> how did infrastructure week, you know, yeah. go, and, you know, I did so, and I realized, you know, gee, this is like the price is right, because you want to get as close as you can to the line, <laughs> but if you go over it, you're dead. <laughs> and so I, I, felt my, uh, I felt my spots, but I have, I'm not like... Um, you know, like, uh, I'm sure, um, you know, um, Britney Spears has, you know, 90 million followers. I have 90,000. <laughs> but on the other side, probably 20,000 of them are press people and the media. So if you send something out, I could count down 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It'll be on all the, at least the business channels and more. Especially if you're doing something that's, you know, that's provocative in the media, that's, that's lively. Mm. So, you know, I did stuff on, um, you know, you know, comment on some of the things that were going on in the government, that, you know, and 
So it's a balance. I mean, I, I owe, people are interested in me because I'm at Goldman Sachs. I owe it to Goldman Sachs not to kill the firm by doing something too stupid um, or too, pro, you know, and so I'm, I'm measured, but it's definitely mine. Goldman Sachs has its own sure. Twitter yeah. account and I have mine. So it sounds like no regrets. So I think it's been, I, I, no, I have no regrets. In fact, if I weren't at Goldman Sachs, I could be really good at this because <laughs> the ones I don't send are really terrific. <laughs> But I write these things out, and I say, am I going to send this? And sometimes I've asked for advice on it, but when I, by the time I'm asking for advice, I know I'm not sending it. Because that's the reason. I'm just basically showing off what a funny thing I saw. Somebody else at Tweet should probably get a little advice, too, huh? Yeah. Um, the uh, last question, then I'll open it up to the audience. Um, so you've been in the CEO role for 12 years. And you know you start out one way, and so with 12 years, you've got some experience. And what would you say are the leadership skills that maybe you undervalued in the early days and that 12 years into this, you find most influential? You know, skills, I think, it's, you know, there's an evolution. You know, the, the pleasure pain principles take hold. If you mm. do some, if you act a certain kind of way and it doesn't work, you do less of it. If it works, you do more of it. I said, you know, over time, you become a different person. I, I'd say the way I think of it, I have to think of it, and this is what I tell people also people don't have a good feeling, they don't always know who they are to other people or the consequences. I think if you understood it, most of the stuff follows from that. Like if you know the impact you have, and I always say as an exercise, you know, where you are in your career, maybe it's a first year MD, a new partner, think of when you were very, you know, much younger in the company, who that person was for you, yeah. and how did you think about that? That's who you are now. Mm. And so I do that today, because I don't think of myself, I realize the, what other people must think, but I do it because I'm like, when I joined the company, it was John Weinberg, John Whitehead. I mean, these were big lions of the industry, you know, famous names, and you know, Bob Rubin was a younger guy mm. then. But I remember how when they came to the floor, how I responded to that, and I realized I have to remind myself, that's what people were thinking of me. I may not think of myself that way naturally, but they are. And that requires, and then, then when you think of things that way, it imposes a certain amount of gravitas, makes you act in that kind of a way. Um, so I think there's, there's that. I always remind people that, you know, you're not necessarily there to be loved. It's good to be loved. I'd rather be loved than not loved. But what you want to do is be appreciated. Hmm. Appreciated. So you'll do things that, you know, not good, that people may not like. You're not there to be their friend. But they don't want, people don't want friends. They want people who make, your contract is to make them better than they otherwise would be, enhance the platform that we can all then share and work off that platform and be better than we would be as an individual. So you have to get people to subordinate their ego, not out of selflessness, but out of a longer term greed that once you make that better platform, we can all exploit it to our own purposes and ends. But you have, but that's a long, that's a, no, a yeah, long-term yeah. thought. And so you have to, I'd say the longer you do it, the more you can give stories because you have the stories. And also what happens is, I realize now that a CEO for 12 years, I was president or vice chairman for six or seven years before that. There's very, you know, there's a very tiny percentage of the company who are at the company who don't remember me as CEO or president of the company. And that's something else too. So. That's, uh, you know, get away with a lot <laughs> because there's nobody who, you know, who nobody remembers. And I sometimes have to remind people, if I'm trying to improve people and I want to say, look, I was like you, that's not credible to people because I was never like them in their experience. Hmm. But I have to, but I have that with my kids too because yeah, you can otherwise, we were talking about this yesterday, <clears throat> you know, your kids have a lot of advantages, but they have a lot of burdens because they only know you the way you are now and whatever mythology attaches to how, you know, how magnificent we are, you know, our long lived wives know the differently, yeah, right. <laughs> but they don't. Yeah. And so you sometimes have to tell them because otherwise you overly intimidate people or right. you, make, you make yourself somebody, something is so good that, they, that you're unapproachable or unobtainable 
and then you can't help them because hmm. you're not human. Yeah. Excellent. Audience, for Lloyd. Here's one here. Oh, I got it. No, we got Jack, too. Go ahead. Lloyd, hi, Lloyd. I think you got a lot of new followers on Twitter. <laughs> and, uh, I was just reading your post, and you had a great one here. I work for a French company. I work for Sanofi, based in Paris. There's a big presence here in Boston. And yeah, I think, think I, was, I think I was getting myself... I, I got myself in trouble with the British government you, over Brexit on those French posts. <laughs> well, you, you, he has a post about attending uh, an international... CEO con conference in France with President Macron and feeling like there's a new day dawning in France. So maybe could you explain that a little bit? Well, Macron, I, you know, I really do think right now, and you know, again, we, you know, we'll have to see how things evolve further, but right now the most important, the central leader in Europe right now is Macron because Merkel, uh, Mrs. Merkel, who's a fabulous politician and has been for 10 years the center and the most influential person in Europe, and maybe you'd say the greatest statesman in the world for some of this period, um, is weakened by having a weak coalition. Whereas Macron got into government with a huge, um, in, a, in a tsunami of support and controls, uh, and con controls his legislature. Now, the question in Paris is also, Will he get cold feet? Will he see it through? But he has such an over, you know, his predecessors didn't, even though they had a bit of a mandate, uh, but got cold feet. You know, the first, you know, you know, the first time they, 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 they set the trucks on fire in the middle of the, <laughs> of the road. So, you know, it, France is France, so I don't have any illusions about how difficult it is for change in that, in that, uh, in that country. But this could be, he's not like a Thatcher or a Reagan, he may be like a Schroeder in Germany, who was a, he was a socialist, but who changed. You know, when we were, it's hard to remember, but we know that Germany is this huge economic power. But if you think back 25 years, which is hard to do, but some of us are old enough to have read newspapers 25 years ago, remember that Germany, the, the book on Germany was, it was going downhill. The first, two, the first two generations after the war were killing themselves, worked hard, but after, the, but after the 80s, remember, remember the depression, the morass people sunk into, Beiner, Meinhof, all this, uh, the socialism that crept across Germany, and all of a sudden, it didn't look good. It was bad. And Schroeder, who, you know, I don't think he's had a great afterlife as in terms of what he's doing now, but at the time, he reset that in Germany, and he got rid of, you know, they had like a, they were going the way of France, short work weeks, you know, unions controlling companies and everything, and that kind of was reversed in a way that Thatcher played that role in different people and um, Reagan. And so people want to see this, and so sometimes you see what you want to see even if it's not there, but I think it's there. And I've spent, I was at that meeting in Versailles and I talked to him and I met with him before. He, I, I knew him from, uh, um, you know, not not friendly, friendly or no one, but I met, had met with him before he got into government. And I think he has the potential to be a real deal. He can either do it or will be disappointed, but I'd say that this is a moment in time where he seems to be on the right track. And the people he has in his government are like that too. The first thing you say, is this just dependent on him? And if he's gone, will it stick? I asked him that question. He said, if it, uh, if it works, it will stick. If it doesn't work, it won't. <laughs> Which is the right answer. None of this, oh, of course it will stick, a new day is dawn, like that. And, um, and so, you know, he, um, and his approval rating is in it, but we'll see. We're watching him in parallel to that is a little bit what's happening in Japan, where Abe has been, I mean, he used to have a different prime minister in Japan more than one a year. And he's been there for a few years now. He came in with a mandate, and now it's kind of a little bit uncertain what, how much further he can go. Everybody gets up unpopular after a few years anyway. So I think the lesson is if he's going to do it, he better do this stuff soon while he has his mandate and you know, rip the bandage off really quickly. 
But if you ask me whether I still have the optimism I tried to convey there, yes, just that the stakes are higher now because he's more, he's more influential now. And he has a bigger percentage of the pool of leadership influence in Europe because of the weakening of Mrs. Merkel. Uh, I have a question. Uh, welcome to the Boston Bull Market. Uh, it's, uh, it's late, but I hope you bring it. Uh, can you tell me two things in your career that you did not get to do that you wish you did that are very important to you? Well, there's a few things. I mean, uh, in my career, I would say less in my career because I've always been shocked to have gotten any opportunity I got and just totally, the only, I'm just totally saturated with concern that I'd screw it up. So it was never like, oh my goodness, I got the silver medal. I'm so disappointed I didn't get the gold medal. <laughs> I was more saying, how did I get the silver? <laughs> that, that was just, so I didn't have that. At various times, I would say, gee, it would have been nice to, um, be nice to get a Rhodes Scholarship. Now I would have had to have applied for it. <laughs> but... In order to have applied for it, I would have had to be somewhat close, and I ruled myself out. Uh, you know, things like that. I, I, um, I think at this point, I'm probably not going to be a member of Augusta, but, but then I'd have to take up golf first. <laughs> so there's a number of things that I think would be highly prestigious and wonderful to do, but I, it's not like I've been teeming with frustration and ambition not to, not, to, not to have it. I've been pretty, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, there's some people in life that I, I look at, you know, I, I flew back from Washington yesterday with Jay, and I, and I think I said this at one point. There's something, almost everything is a blessing and a curse, but one thing of that is there's some people I know who are terrific and the world looks at them, they're highly influential, and you know that they must have been voted the most likely to succeed in kindergarten. <laughs> that their entire lives, they were the good-looking guy, the <laughs> captain of the football team, they were this and that their entire lives. And those are the people who I think get far, but probably could have the most potential for disappointment. And then there are people who are like late bloomers who find themselves at unexpected places and where it's like kind of all good. <laughs> we won't speculate on which one of those you are. Uh, let, me just, just, let me just add one addition to that, uh, Lloyd. Um, uh, I'm going through this process right now. I'm retiring at the end of the year and thinking about what the next act is. Um, we know that you haven't announced your retirement um, yet, but what would the... I tell you, the Wall Street Journal reported it. <laughs> Um, which is more of a, you know, what I'm saying, more of a wish fulfillment than a... But knowing but, that it isn't happened yet, but what, what kinds of things would fulfill you after work? You know, I don't know. I'm worried about it. I don't know. Uh, my wife says, don't quit. I think part of that is selfish, that she doesn't want me around, <laughs> but she, she at, least, at least catches it as for my own good. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about it, hmm. but I do know that it's very hard to leave these jobs. Mm. Um, it's they're hard jobs to get. And that was something that one of my predecessors told me. Because people have been speculating when I'm leaving for the day I got the job. <laughs> and so one time he said, you know, you know, don't leave so quickly. They're hard to get. And that, that's true. But I also know, you know, how many, other than Jim Brown, who leaves at the top? <laughs> Nobody, you know, you have to be a certain age for that. And i say it another way. When things are going badly, and, and our job is very volatile, you know, we're in the financial, our job in part is trying to guess the future. That really guesses it. I mean, really? <laughs> and trying to get there and try to get it right and managing risks, and who knows what's, and it, it's hard to get that right all the time or even a lot. So things go good and you know, go well, they go badly. When things are going badly, you can't leave. 
when things are going well, you don't want to leave. <laughs> and so you almost by definition, you have to leave when you don't want to leave. Because one you can't and the other you don't want, but you still can. <laughs> and so I know that I have to leave when I don't want to leave. Now, my immediate my, my last five predecessors had kind of got the nor the normal by history way out for us at C you know Goldman Sachs CEO land is going to the government. So my last five predecessors went into the government. You know, Paulson, you know, Paulson, Friedman, Whitehead, Corzine, Rubin, Bob Rubin, went into the government. And the one six back died at his desk. So you know, the government doesn't seem that available for me now. <laughs> And I'm not sure I'm dying. To, I'm not sure I want to die at my desk. So it creates a, a problem. But I'm not going to leave. I don't think I'm destined to leave because I'm finding something else attractive. I just think I'm going to have to have the discipline to leave when I when I want to stay. And but I you know I read a lot of history and I know how things go and evolve and and that's what's going to happen. I you know I there was press on my tenure recently and it, it's frequent. But it really, what the story was that we winnowed down the succession candidates. Said nothing about my tenure, um, and so that's why I tweeted that the you know Wall Street, you know that uh, I did that. Huck, I said I felt like Huck Finn uh, listening to my own eulogy from the Wall Street Journal. Um, but so it wasn't right, but it may not be wrong forever, you know, because you know because it will. Twelve years is, as you know, twelve years in this job is like Methuselah, like that, you know. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, I was, um, you know, I had to be thoughtful. That I was sick for a while. Yep. Um, so, you know, you, you, I thought about this stuff along the way. But I'll tell you, I don't know what I would do, but I know I want to do something. Yeah. And that's also part of it because I'd like to have a runway to do something, but I'd also like to know what it is. That's why the first thing I said when I saw Jay, because we were in Washington together, we, did, we, were, kind of, we were participating in something together yesterday, and flew back together, and I just kept cross-examining, how are you thinking about this? How are you thinking about this? And he starts talking about golf <laughs> and all these, you know. And um, so I am still, I'm still looking. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Lloyd Blankbein. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you, Jake. I know none of us want to leave, but time is up. Thank you so much.